Okay, so uh, uh, we'll start in a minute. We don't have polls today because uh, I'm trying to get through the uh, the uh, topics for today in the 90, 80 minutes we have, and polls end up taking up to five minutes of our time. So this is an experiment to see if that really helps. But this means that if you have questions, you guys must post on chat and either I or one of the TAs will respond to you. You're not gonna be provided extra cues or uh, any other assistance in trying to follow the material because that's what the polls usually do and those are gonna be missing today. Anyway, so let me start. We're going to continue with our, can everybody hear me? Yes, no? Yeah. Yes. yes. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to continue with our series on recurrent neural networks. And today we're gonna to talk about uh, LSTMs, about the issue of how do we define, uh, we'll start discussing the issue of how do we define divergences. And uh, we'll look a little bit at language modeling as a prep for future lectures. So here's what we've seen so far. Recurrent networks retain information from the infinite past, but only in principle. In practice, they're poor at memorization because hidden output values can blow up or shrink depending on the eigenvalues of the recurrent weights matrix and also depending on the activation function and its Jacobian. And also recurrent and deep networks suffer from a vanishing or exploding gradient problem where the gradient of the loss gets concentrated into a small number of parameters, small number of terms in, in earlier layers and goes to zero for most of the others. And so uh, we saw that this is all uh, a uh, outcome of how we design traditional recurrent neural networks. In a traditional recurrent neural network, the hidden state at any time is a nested function which is of, of the uh, recurrent weights and the recurrent activations. And we saw how long the network remembers any input, depends on this weights matrix and on this activation. Also, when you're trying to update the network parameters, again, whether you can successfully compute derivatives depends on the weights matrix again and the Jacobian of the activation. Now, what comes across is that whether you're able to learn to remember or whether you're able to remember in the first place has nothing to do with what you what it is you're trying to remember. In fact, what the network ends up holding in memory also ends up being independent of what it is you're trying to remember. It just ends up being purely dependent on the activations and these parameters. And this is not something that we want. Instead, we want a network that remembers for arbitrarily long to be recalled on demand. One where how long something is remembered is not a function of network parameters, but rather uh, based on some input-based determination of whether this, this information must be remembered. For example, if we are analyzing a C program, when we encounter an open race, we would like the model to remember that this race has been opened and retain the memory until the brace is closed. And once it has discovered that the brace is closed, then it must forget about it. This should not depend on the network parameters. It must depend only on the fact that this is an open brace and that this must be closed. Now, so we want to replace these blocks with something that doesn't fade or blow up but something that retains memory for arbitrarily long depending on the, uh, on the information being remembered. So we will replace these blocks. We will eliminate both the weights matrix and the activation. And instead we'll include a switch that explicitly analyzes the input and based on it decides if the memory must be retained or not. That's going to give us an equation of this kind you initially detect a pattern through this, this uh, C of X zero. And subsequently at each time, you operate on this memory using a switch, which retains, modifies, 
or erases the memory based on the current input. So that gives us the structure, which is called a constant error carousel. The history CT over here is computed from the input and it's carried through uncompressed and un by weights and unmodified by activations. Instead, at each time, there is this operation over here, which I've represented as a multiplication, which, which is controlled by this gating term over here, which, base, which in turn is based on a number of factors, including the current input and the current context. Now, again, here I'm only showing a single line, but the line actually represents a bank of lines going into the slide. And in all of these figures, we are seeing the net edge on. So the constant error carousel over here just really holds the memory. It has no non-linearities or even linear, uh, even uh, non-identity linearities of its own. The actual non-linear work is done by other portions of the network. Neurons that compute a workable state from the memory. And the gate over here, which decides if the memory must be modified, considers the current input, but also considers the current state, which, which captures what is already in the memory. And in addition, it may consider other context terms that may be useful to detect if the relevant patterns required to modify, the, the, which, which may be useful to detect if the input contains relevant patterns that require it to modify the memory. And so this context term may also include what's in raw memory itself through this direct connection, which as we will see in a few minutes is called a peephole connection. So this structure over here is the basis for a model called the long short term memory or LSTM. And uh, in all of the figures that, I've, that follow, I've actually used uh, a format and even borrowed heavily from this from this blog over here, cola.github.io. So many of these pictures uh, are used by several people on the web. You might find these pictures on the web, but the explanations of course are just mine. Anyway, so any questions so far? This was just what we did in the last class. I'm going to pick up from here. So any questions? No, okay. So before looking at LSTMs, consider a standard recurrent neural network. Here is one layer of a standard recurrent neural network. Each green block over here shows what happens at one time instant. Remember, this is a series model. It operates at each, it, 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 it has recurrence over time. This block represents the computation occurring at one time instant. So we're going to refer to each of these blocks as a cell. Now, the entire recurrence is obtained by chaining the cells across time. The complete RNN could actually have many of these stacked one on top of the other. In a standard recurrent neural network at each time, the cell computes an affine function of the input into the cell at that time and the previous hidden state value and passes this affine function through an activation, typically a tan age, to compute the new hidden state. And this new hidden state is both passed on to the next time instant at the same, same uh, layer of the network, but it's also passed upwards to the next layer of the network at the same time instant. Now, when you replace the RNN with a long, long short-term memory net, then these cells, the overall structure remains much the same, but these cells have a more complex setup. So here is the figure for a single cell. Again, remember that all of these lines and boxes represent layers of neurons and banks of connections that go into the page. These sigmas over here are uh, sigmoid neurons. The tan H over here is a layer with tan H activation. Layers are fully connected to their inputs, but these addition multiplications and additions are component ones. Now, the key component of this LSTM cell is this backbone, which is the 
so-called constant error carousel that we just discussed. This is the component that holds the memory. Now the CC lines just carry the memory signal CT. At each time, the memory CT minus one, which is the memory from the previous time, enters the cell. It gets modified by two components. One is a multiplicative modification by a gate, which can shrink what is in memory. And the, and the other is an addition, which can increment what is in memory. And once these two operations are performed, that is the updated memory that is passed on to the next cell. Now, there are several gates in the LSTM as we saw, in the, in the cells as we saw. Each gate over here is a simple sigmoidal unit, which outputs a value in the range zero one. Multiplying any signal by the gate will either shrink it or in the best case, keep it as it is. The gate that multiplies the CC line directly over here is called a forget gate. It determines if the incoming signal and the constant error carousel is to be retained or should it be shrunk, should it be forgotten a little bit. Now to decide whether a memory must be forgotten or not, the gate considers the input to the cell. So this is not necessarily the input input. This, this could also be the, the output from the lower layer, but it's the input to the cell. In addition to the input to the cell, it also considers the previous hidden state at the same layer, the recurrent hidden state as context. And based on these inputs, it, it computes a gating value. So what this, gating, what this gate does here, if you go back to our coding example, if you want to decide if an open brace is to be forgotten, we need to know from memory whether a brace has been opened in the first place and from the input, whether a closed brace has been seen in the input. So that is the, uh, the, that is the contribution of these two terms over here. And the gate operates on this combination to compute a value, which is between zero and one, which multiplies this CEC term. Now, the affine combination, of course, that it, com that it computes, of course, is, uh, is obtained by multiplying the concatenation of these two values, the previous hidden state and the input to the cell by a weight matrix and adding a bias. And the output is obtained by applying the sigmoid activation to this affine value. Now, the second component of the LSTM is the additive term, uh, which uh, is given by this little block here, whose output adds to the CEC. Say we encountered an open brace and stored it in memory. Then we encountered a second open brace. We want to increment the memory to account for this. So this second line over here, uh, this, this, uh, uh, the second line over here, this actually detects if the uh, such useful patterns have been found and based on it, it increments the memory in the CEC. Now the pattern detection over here itself has two parts. The first is a perceptron with a TANH activation over here, this one, this guy. This perceptron acts on a combination of the input and, and the historical context. And based on these, it detects relevant patterns. The second is an input gate, which also operates on the same two inputs. And the purpose of the hidden input gate over here is to determine if the pattern that this guy here has discovered is even worth remembering. So to increment the memory, we multiply the output of the pattern detector by the value computed by the input gate. If we have found a useful pattern and it has been deemed worth remembering, then we add this product to what is currently in the CEC. Now, although it's stated, so, so here is the uh, uh, CEC value over here. After these two operations have been performed, the updated memory in the constant error carousel is the forget gate value over here times 
the incoming memory ct minus 1 plus whatever pattern has been detected c tilde t by this input pattern detector multiplied in turn by the output of the by the input gate value so the sum of these two terms is the mem is the output memory now although it's stated in this complicated way uh, this is uh, yeah this is element wise multiplication so uh, I is the gate, C tilde is the pattern detector. Now, although I'm sort of saying this in this very complicated way, and that's how everybody uh, describes it, it's this combination is actually just a more complex gate. Now, imagine that both this sigma over here and this tan h over here had the same incoming weights matrix. After all, they're operating on the same inputs, right? Then the, sig the tan H has an activation like this. The sigmoid has an activation like this. So the product term over here just ends up being one common activation, which looks something like this. If I can get the blue, which just ends up looking like this. So, so although it's usually stated as a product of a pattern detector and a, forget and a gate, it's more it's more in the nature of a more complex activation that looks something like this but it's kind of convenient to think of it as the combination of a pattern detector and a gate which decides whether the pattern is worth remembering or not now this cc over here itself only contains raw memory uncomplex memory to compute the actual hidden state we will actually put this raw memory through a tan H activation. This is what we'll call a tan H compression. This tan H is applied individually to each line, but we don't simply report the memory contents after uh, compressing it. We like to gate it. Now, again, uh, this gate is empirically found to be useful, although it may not be immediately apparent why you would need more gate. Now, why the sigmoid gate? Uh, tan H becomes negative. So the sigmoid is a scaling factor between zero and one. So you compress, reduce the memory or increase it. You can't negatively remember stuff. So uh, the way these things are, so, so uh, uh, this, the sigmoid gates is, again, these are design choices. You could try, you could experiment with other things, but intuitively speaking, the purpose of the gates is to compress what's in memory. The purpose of the pattern detector is to increment or decrement what's in memory. Now, uh, so again, this CEC just holds the raw memory, but to compute a working state, we compress it through a tan H, but then we don't just leave it so, we also compute an additional gate, something called the output gate, and this output gate further compresses what, what comes through the tan H. Now, once again, it might be worth thinking that, remembering that the product of these two guys is just a more complex gate, not necessarily just uh, you know, this structure. This structure only holds if both of them have the same weights. The structure may be more complicated than that, but this is just a more complex gate, uh, which may not be immediately interpretable, but intuitively it's more appealing to think of it as saying, that I can compute a state from the memory. And then based on what else I have seen in the input and the context, I decide whether the state must be reported as is or whether it must be further shrunk from what is computed. So the, uh, and now finally, uh, we also have uh, the, uh, the raw memory itself goes through this main line. And uh, the raw memory carries information that may have been lost in the process of compression over here. So later in the initial designs of the LSTM, you didn't have the raw memory didn't directly feed to the gates. Later it was found to be useful to actually have a direct line from the raw memory to these gates. And so this connection is called what is called, is, is what is called the peephole connection. 
this raw memory only connects to the gates in the standard design. It doesn't actually connect to this pattern detector. Furthermore, the uh, initial raw memory, CT minus one, is what feeds into the input gate and the forget gate. The updated raw memory is what feeds in to the output gate. So the overall operation of these three gates is, is like this. The forget gate operates on the concatenation of the raw memory, the, previous, the incoming raw memory, the incoming state, and the input. The input gate, which is this one, also operates on the same combination. The output gate operates on a concatenation of the output raw memory, the incoming hidden state, and the input. Now, these things, uh, these are standard definitions of the LSTM. The basic intuition is what I presented earlier. The actual implementation details uh, can be varied. And as you will see in a, later in today's lecture, there have been other variants of this uh, cell, cell structure that have also been proposed. But the basic concept of having a memory that is not modified by weights or activations but only updated through additional additive or multiplicative terms, which decide whether the memory must be modified based on patterns detected in the input. This is the key concept of the LSTM-like structures. So here is the complete LSTM cell, the original as it was originally defined with all the gates and connections. The, uh, previous raw memory, CT minus one, and the previous hidden state, HT minus one, come in recurrently. We also get the current input XT, which could be either directly from the input or from a lower layer. And the outputs are the updated memory and the updated state. The updated state is going to also go recurrently into the same layer LSTM seller the next time and also go upwards into whatever other processes are occurring higher up in the network at the same time. And here is the full set of equations for one step of computation within an LSTM. We compute three gates, the forget gate, the input gate, and the output gate. We also compute three sets of values. The first is the output, or the, the output of the pattern detector, C tilde. So this one here is the output of the pattern detector. And then there's the updated memory, which is this one, which is computed from the incoming memory and the output of the pattern detector and also combines these gates. And finally, the, uh, the uh, state value at that time itself, which is computed from the updated memory. Now, here, if you see the order in which things are computed, it gets a little tricky. The output gate over here, this refers to the updated memory. These gates refer to the incoming memory. And so, if you wanted to perform these computations, you could initially compute the forget gate and the input gate. You can also compute the output of the pattern detector here. And these three guys are going to be required to compute the updated memory. Now the updated memory is then used to compute the output gate. And the updated memory and the output gate are then finally used to compute the hidden state itself. So uh, this is the general sequence of operations. Now, if I were to write this in, in uh, pseudocode, here's what it would look like. I'm going to write this because I'm thinking, speaking of it in terms of cells, I'm going to write it in an object-oriented way. We'll write the code for a single cell and assume the, uh, so the, CEC, the constant error carousel is just the raw memory. The state itself is computed from the raw memory and it's computed from the raw memory for a complex operation where it's first compressed through a tan H activation. And then you multiply that output through, a, multiply the, the, the result 
through with the uh, output of the output gate, with the value computed, computed by the output gate. So the hidden state is a non-linearly processed version of the memory. Now, this is a very good question and we'll get to, uh, and it, the whole process looks slightly redundant and you'll see in a few minutes that there are variants which don't do this. So anyway, so I'm going to write the pseudocode over here in an object-oriented way. I'm going to have write the code for a single cell and assume that all local variables that are not required outside of the cell will be stored within the cell itself. So here are all the variables required by a cell. It gets the incoming CEC value. It gets the hidden state from the previous time at the same layer. It gets the input from uh, X, which could either be the actual input or the lower layer uh, output. These are, of course, the parameters for the cell, which are all the weights and biases required by all the gates and other pattern detectors within the cell. The cell outputs the updated CEC value, the updated memory, and the updated state, state for the next time. Right? So the actual code for the cell is going to look something like this. This is just straightforward uh, implementation of what we just saw. We compute the affine value for the forget gate using the previous uh, uh, CH and, and the input X. Then we compute the forget gate value. We compute the affine value for the, for the uh, input gate and then the input gate value. Then we compute the uh, affine value for the input pattern detector. And then from the affine value, we actually compute the input patterns. Then finally, we compute the updated memory, where the updated memory is the forget gate times the incoming memory, plus the input gate times the output of the pattern detector. Yes, this has a peephole. So this term over here, remember, the peephole is what you're getting from the raw memory. So if you see the C over here, this, is, this has the peephole. And then finally, when you've computed the updated memory, you compute the output gate, you compress the, uh, and then you compress the raw memory using tanh and multiply it by the output gate value. And so at this process you point, you have computed both the updated memory and the updated state, and these are, uh, these are returned out. This is for a single cell. For the entire network, this is just like a regular RNN now. The, uh, uh, the uh, initial memory is set to zero. And then, because initially you don't remember anything, right? Then we uh, step through time. And at each step, we at each time we step through the layers of the net and compute an LSTM cell. The zeroth cell, the zeroth layer, or the cell of the zeroth layer is just the input itself. This is below the network. But then subsequently, at each time within each layer, the LSTM cell is going to get the memory from the same layer at the previous time, the hidden state from the same layer at the previous time, the hidden state from the same time in the lower layer, and of course the parameters. And using all of these, it's going to compute the updated memory at that time and the updated state value at that time. So, you, the uh, uh, LSTM cells, and you, you loop through the layers of the LSTM cells in this manner. And then once you have been through all of the uh, cells, once you get to the final layer, you can just compute the affine value for the output and apply the softmax. So this is, this is not the recurrent portion of the network. This is the output portion. This is the recurrent portion of the computation. Now, training the network. So, so the computation looks superficially a lot like what you would have for a, for a regular RNN, but clearly within each cell, there's a lot more complexity. So how does this update, uh, affect training? Training in an LSTM is just like training a regular RNN. We define a sequence divergence between the output of the network and the desired output and back propagate the derivatives through time. The one big difference is that instead of back propagating derivatives through a, a, a standard RNN unit, now we're going to back propagate it through an 
LST himself. And that ends up looking uh, more complex. Just, let's just look at it pictorially first. To compute the derivative for uh, CT, for instance, which is, if you want to compute how much more, you know, perturbing this memory here is going to affect the divergence. Let's compute all the paths through which CT affects the divergence. Let's consider all of them. We get one path through, see it's CT over here already, right? So you get one path uh, through HT because CT is compressed and uh, it becomes HT, which influences downstream computations. You get one path through the gate, through the output gate. You get one direct path forward, which, uh, uh, which is how CT actually is used in the computation of CT plus one. And then a path through the forget gate, and then a path through the input gate. And, and all of these contributions, the contributions of all of these paths get added. So you end up with this ugly looking equation over here, which is incomplete. And if you were to sit yourself down and actually try to write the equations, for the derivative for CT, you're going to find that it's really tedious. Uh, same thing, let's say I want to compute the derivative for HT. Let's look at all of the paths through which HT influences the divergence. HT goes up to the next layer. So clearly uh, there's a path coming down from, this, from the next layer at the same time. You have paths coming in from the same layer the next time. And there are several of these paths, all of which influence HT and all of their contributions must add to the derivatives. So as you can see very quickly, trying to write out the derivatives and these, these paths, these aren't even complete, these are just partial, right? So clearly trying to explicitly write out the derivatives for these terms is going to be very challenging. And I'm not even going to try to, uh, do this for the weights, right? So, okay, given this, uh, wait, Manish has a question. Can we do this without having the hidden state layer? We're getting the output pattern through the whole process, so how significant? The compression is important. This is raw memory. So the, the H is all about compressing what's in raw memory. It's a nonlinear process. And as we've seen, the nonlinearity is, is, is key in making neural networks what they are. We'll deal with that in a few minutes. Just, just stay with me, right? So anyway, here is my question to you guys. Computing all of these derivatives in using rigorous arithmetic is very, very painful. So given this, if I were to give you the problem of performing back propagation through an LSTM, how would you do it? Anyone? Does anybody want to take a guess? Autograd, brilliant, right? But you know, even without autograd, computation, autograd, computation, autograd and compute graph, the simple operation, suppose you were not using autograds and compute graphs. We did something with CNNs. What did we do? Anyone remember? Convert to MLP, no. So we did something very trivial when we were speaking of CNNs. What was the trivial thing we did? We just took the forward code and ran it backwards, right? And when we ran the forward code in each backwards at each time, we, uh, every line in the compute line in the forward code was flipped. So that instead of computing an output from an input, we computed the derivatives from there for the input from the, from the derivative for the output. So it was a trivial change of code which computed all the derivatives. Do you remember this for CNNs? And yeah, right? Easy thing, right? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do, the, do this through code. I have pseudocode for several slides over here explaining it. The process is actually quite trivial and follows the same logic 
that we used when we performed back prop for CNNs. Let's first consider, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. I'll just sort of, sort of, sort of outline it, but I expect you to go through the slides because it's instructive. I'm going to start with the forward code for the LSTM cell, which takes in the uh, C previous CC output, the previous state, the current input, and produces the current CC output and the current state. Now, when I invert it, what will the inputs here be for this one? Going backwards, anyone? What are the inputs going to be? If I'm computing the derivatives backwards, what are the inputs for this all going to be? Derivative of uh, divergence with respect to CO and derivative of divergence with respect to Absolutely, to brilliant. That's exactly. So now you took in these inputs and computed these outputs. Going backwards, you're going to take the derivatives with respect to these guys and compute the derivatives with respect to these guys. And that all computation is going to be done going backwards from here to here. That's all you're going to do. So let's take a look. What is the last operation over here? When you go in, you already have DHO, right? And you also have DCO, right? We have HO equals O times tan H DCO. So let's go there. The last thing is HO is O times tan H DCO. So going back from here, I can compute DO. This is DHO times times tan CO, tan HCO. And again, remember, uh, we also want to, uh, we will update the derivatives for, for CO as well. So because the derivative for CO split out, we're literally just going backwards through these equations. We're going to pass the derivative on the LH, LHS on the left-hand side and compute or update the derivatives for the terms on the right-hand side. So DO is going to be DHO times tan H. Look at the transpositions and such like that to make sure the dimensions are right. Then the derivative for tan H is going to be dH times O. And the derivative for CO is going to be incremented by the, uh, because you already have tan H, it's the derivative for the tan H itself. D tan H times one minus tan H squared. So then what was the previous operation? Just before that, the uh, previous operation here was computing O equals sigmoid of zero, right? So I can invert that. By the time you come here, you already you should already have DO. DO has been computed here. So I can compute DZO. The output is over here, right? So DZO can be computed as DO times the derivative of the sigmoid. And then I can go, go one step up. The previous equation was this guy, zero was the sum of all of these terms. By the time we come here, we have D zero. So you can compute the derivatives for every one of these terms on the right. And you can keep walking your way back through the code, through the forward code, and updating your derivatives for every single term in the LSTM cell. And then when you have got yourself all the way back to the top of the code, you will now have the derivative for C, H, X, and the parameters. These are the terms that went into the network and these can be returned. So uh, I know I'm not being very explicit over, explicit over here. It's kind of painful to explain these equations one at a time, but the general principle, is this making sense to you guys? I expect you to go back and look at the slides. Is this it's very straightforward and very simple. And uh, uh, there's an even simpler version that we have put out on, uh, on the slide deck called how to compute a derivative and take a look at it. How to compute a derivative is how, what we build AutoGrad on. So please do take a look. So that procedure now tells us how to compute the derivatives for the input to the LSTM cell given the derivatives for the output. Now, so now we can use it for the entire network. Here's the forward code again. We go through time, we go through layers, 
and uh, at each time, at, and at each time within each layer, we compute the LSTM cell. Finally, we compute, finally we compute the output. So going backwards, uh, we start at the final time and wind down all the way to zero. So the time goes backwards as expected. At each time, we assume that we have the derivative with respect to the of, of the divergence with respect to the output at that time. So this is dyt. And that, and so from that, we can compute the derivatives for the affine value to affine input to the output layer at that time. We can also increment the derivatives for the parameters of the output layer. And then you wind your way back through the layers of the cell of, of the uh, LSTM. There's only one interesting modification. What all that is happening over here is this LSTM cell backwards. This is taking in the derivative with respect to the output memory, the uh, and the derivative and the derivative with respect to the hidden state and the input. But then here's something interesting. If you look at this guy over here, what exactly is this? This one, when you have the cell, remember the H is going forward, it's also going up, right? So when you're going backwards through the layers, you've already gone back in time. At this point, you have a derivative coming this way and you have a derivative coming this way and they both must be added to give you the real derivative with respect to H. So that is the one extra fancy step over here. This addition actually considers the fact that the hidden state is taking two paths out of the cell and that you must compute the derivatives. You must sum the derivatives along both paths to get the actual derivative with respect to the output state. The rest of the arithmetic is just straightforward. But this, you do this even in a standard RNF. And you can just literally just implement this code and this should work, right? Again, I'm not spending time on this. That is only meant to give you some kind of a high level flavor of how the, uh, how the backdrop works. Please go over the slides. If you find any errors, post on Piazza will fix it. So now, so the LSTM, we sort of got an idea of how the LSTM cell works. You have the constant error Caruso and you have modifications to the memory based on patterns detected in the input. But why is it so complex? I mean, what, why? You should have an obvious question for why. Uh, some of the computation here seems redundant as several of you have pointed out on chat. Why keep the memory and the hidden state separately when one is just derived from the other, right? Why have a separate input and a forget gate? Because if you're remembering something new, then you're not, then you're incrementing the memory. If you're forgetting something, clearly there's nothing to be remembered. So these, these two seem to be correlated, right? Uh, so there, there's a lot of redundant computation over here that are at least superficially redundant that we'd like to simplify. And the gated recurrent unit is one such attempt at simplifying the LSTM. There have been others. You can come up with your own designs. So in the, G, in the gated uh, uh, recurrent unit or the GRU, we realize that there's no need to have separate input and forget gates. If a new input is seen that's worth remembering, then the old memory is likely to be forgotten. So I'm just going to say that the forget gate is value is one minus the input gate value. There's no need to maintain separate memory and hidden state. Just keep the memory. The memory is the hidden state, but we will have an output gate and we are only going to use the output gate over here to detect uh, new patterns for memory. So this results in the simplified operation where the uh, hidden memory is the hidden state. And whenever you want to work on this hidden state, at that point, you will compress it using the tan -H and use the compressed version. Uh, and th those are generally used when you want to compute gates or these pattern detectors. And that is the point at which you will compress what's in memory. It becomes part of the process rather than, rather than part of the state. Again, this is just one way of uh, simplifying the LSTM. They, they, you can have others, 
Some of it is, seems non-intuitive. Some of it is just thrown in there because it's empirically been found to work. Uh, but uh, the key point is the underlying concept. If you retain the concept, there are other designs you could, you could come up with and some of them will work better than, other, better than others. So questions, anyone? Any questions? No, okay. So LSTMs and GRUs can now be used in any kind of record architecture like this one. The only difference is that now each of these green boxes will be a layer of LSTM or, uh, so, so J, again, in some problems, yes, in other problems, no. There's a certain degree of black magic that happens in these things. And also the LSTMs don't actually, are not truly independent of parameters when it comes to retaining memory or uh, uh, passing gradients backwards during backdrop. Because if you actually look carefully at the arithmetic, eventually what's in memory is being influenced by, by, by the weights matrices except that the weights matrices are now influencing the gates and the gates are influencing the output. So all that happens is that you're sort of stretching out the memory and the gradient behavior of the recurrent neural, neural network and giving it more of a dependence on the input. It doesn't, instead of being entirely independent of the input, it now becomes partially dependent on the input. But, uh, and the uh, differences in complexity uh, is, have to do with, uh, uh, the trade-off in these terms. So this is simply a black magic, right? Now, so this is how you actually use the LSTMs or GRUs, just like a standard recurrent network, except these green boxes will now be LSTM cells. And you can also embed them in bi-directional networks. Now the cells will be LSTM or GRU units, all the other usual rules for bi-directional recurrent networks apply. And so the story so far, uh, the new addition is LSTMs are an alternative formalism where memory is made more directly dependent on the input rather than network parameters and structure. Through a constant error charism, which has no weights or activations, but instead has direct switching and increment decrement operations through pattern recognizers. So these, in theory, do not suffer from a vanishing gradient problem, but they will. Uh, uh, suffer from an exploding gradient issue. Yes, Jay, you're absolutely correct. It's more like a residual connection, except now it also has multiplicative updates, not just additive updates. So, okay, questions? I'm moving on. I'm done with LSTMs. Any questions? Professor, I have a question here. Yeah. So, so we are using tanh uh, for uh, for the pattern detection and sigmoid for for forget gates so yeah. how, so uh, what will be the situation where the um, gradients can explode we are already compressing it right so again uh, i recommend that you actually try work your way through, back you have multiplicative terms going on over here right you have something so what comes on over here is one you're always getting alpha h plus beta, meaning uh, gate times h t minus one plus some extra term, right? Mm -hmm. So the multiplicative term that effectively operates on h t minus one to give you h t will often be greater than one. It will be greater than one. Yeah, right, because there's a multiplication and an addition, correct? Mm -hmm. So imagine that this multiplication value is one and this addition value is one, which is the upper limit, right? Mm -hmm. So then HT is going to be two times HT minus one. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You see? Right. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this can blow up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So we've seen the basic structure of the recurrent networks and their variance and learning rules, but now we have to consider the next level of issues which is how do we define the sequence divergence for common problems and how does that affect how we train these networks? So we're going to see these and some more issues next. Here's the key issue in all of this. The divergence is defined between the sequence of actual outputs and the sequence of desired outputs. So the question now is, 
what is this divergence? What does this look like? Especially keeping in mind that these two sequences need not have a perfect match. And uh, we will see what, why that is so. So to get into that first, we're going to spend a little time looking at uh, these issues, different, you know, what are the different kinds of neural network recurrent architectures and how do we train them? And we're going to look at the issue of synchrony. How do you train recurrent networks when the target output is time synchronous with the input, when the target output is order synchronous, but not time synchronous, and when the target output is not at all synchronous with the input? How do we make predictions and inferences in such networks? So if these, uh, this terminology isn't making sense, it should begin making sense in a few seconds. And for them to make sense, we will first look at some standard variants to recurrent neural networks. I've taken these images from Andre Karpati's, Karpati's page. Some of the pictures are mine, but again, the these format of these pictures are also his. This is, uh, uh, so again, if you want to understand these better, you might want to also look at Andre's page. The pink boxes over here represent inputs. The green boxes are hidden layers. And the blue box over here is the output layer. Now here is one form of recurrence. There's no recurrence at all. Each input is individually processed by the hidden layer and then finally by the output. So this is just a conventional MLP. There's no recurrence. If you got an input time series, you process each input in the series independently. The second figure shows a recurrent network time synchronous outputs. The network processes a sequence of inputs and produces one output for every input. So at each time you have an input and you have an output at each time. So that means you're going to have as many outputs as inputs and you're going to have one output for every input. The output is time synchronous. This is the kind of network you would use if you were say predicting stock markets daily. Every day you'd have read all the stock values until that day and you'd have made that day's prediction or if you were doing part of speech tagging, you have a sequence of words coming in, but every word you must determine the corresponding part of speech tag. The third variant is the figure to the left. This is the full sequence classification. Here, we process an entire series of inputs and produce a single output. We'd need this, for example, uh, if you were analyzing an entire sentence and classifying its sentiment, is it positive or is it negative? Or you're analyzing a passage and you want to answer, is it talking about cricket or is it talking about football? So, uh, or speech recognition with, with, with isolated uh, word recognition where you look at the entire sequence of inputs and then finally at the end you say, this was the word, hello. So here the entire input must be processed and then you get a single output. This fourth variant is more complex. This is order synchronous, but time asynchronous, meaning you, re, you get a sequence of inputs, you get a sequence of outputs, but you do not have one-to-one -one correspondence between the inputs and the outputs. So can anybody think of a situation where this happens? Anyone? Question answering. Question answering. Question answering, typically you get a question and then the question answering is going to look more like the one to the left, right? Speech to text, right? You're going to get speech. You're going to get many, 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 many vectors at speech. And then, you know, the output is going to be maybe two words or three words, right? And when do you want to output the word? When the word is ended, that's when you want to output that word. And the different words may be different lengths. So the, uh, let the, these durations can all be different. Now there is order synchrony, meaning the order in which the input happens is strictly tied to the order in which the output happens. If you change the input order, the order of vectors in, in the input, the output order will change and you, cannot, and you cannot change and you cannot have a different output order for a different, for a specific input order, right? If I change the, uh, uh, the uh, phonemes in my input, if I change my speech signal, the words will change. So I can, so, so there's a very strict order dependence. It's one-to-one, -one, 
The initial portion of the speech is going to be corresponding to the first word. The next segment of speech is going to be corresponding to the next word. The third segment of speech is going to, going to correspond to the next third word. So this is order synchronous. What about order asynchronous? Well, uh, we'll get to that in two lectures, but machine translation, right? So uh, the number of, if I'm translating from English to say Hindi, the order in which the English words happen and the order in which the, the Hindi words happen are very different. The first word may in English may, may correspond to the last word in the Hindi sentence. The number of words can be different. So there it's order asynchronous, right? So uh, this is, here are more variants. This is what I call a posteriori sequence to sequence conversion. You read and process the entire sequence of inputs and then generate the entire sequence of outputs. And this is the kind of structure you would need in machine translation because as Tushar says, as pointed out, this is a order asynchronous problem. You'd have English words, you'd have words maybe in French. This order has nothing to do with this order. And until you have gotten to the end of the English, you don't really know what to output. For example, or you know, in if this were not English, in many languages, you can speak the entire sentence, but how the words connect together is dependent on the word which occurs last. You can have subject, object, verb, subject, verb, object. These are two different orders. And so you have to wait till the end over here before you decide what must be offered. So this is order asynchronous. And this is also a posteriori sequence to sequence conversion. You read the entire sequence. After it's done, you generate the entire output sequence. So here, do you mean the first word in, let's say, English sentence may not correspond to the first word in the Hindi sentence? So At that all, is right. Okay. Yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah. Right. And the number of words in the English sentence and the number of words in the Hindi sentence can be very different. I mean, if you've ever watched Chinese subtitles, it's very funny. Uh, you will find like a 17 sentence English text and then three characters in Chinese. So, you know, it's very, very asynchronous and very different, right? So, uh, and this one here is a special case of this. Now, uh, where a single, uh, a single <laughs> input, uh, there's a single input a posteriori sequence generation where the network sees one or a small number of seed inputs and then produces an output sequence. You'd have this, for example, for image captioning, the image goes in and the entire caption is output, right? So do you understand the difference between these different formats, guys, questions? Uh, for the a posteriori sequence to sequence, uh, here it shows three input, three output. But do you mean that in general, the number of and the number of output can be different? The number of inputs and outputs can be very different. This is just illustrative, right? So okay. I have this is stuff coming in, this stuff going out. Right? Okay. So let's look at this sample model first. This is just a regular MLP. If I use it to analyze sequences, I'm just going to apply the same MLP repeatedly and independently to each input in the sequence and get an output for it. So there are going to be as many outputs as inputs. The analysis is time synchronous because the output is in exactly the same order as the input and one-to-one. -one. But there's no real recurrence because the output over here has no dependence on these inputs or these outputs, right? So there's no connection across time and stuff. So there's no records. Now, uh, so, but then again, the divergence, you can tie them all, all up through a divergence because you have one output per input during training. You will also have one desired output per input, but you can define the divergence as the divergence between two sequences. Now, uh, the uh, special case is where the divergence between the two sequences is just defined as the sum of the divergences at the individual instance. And then you can just compute your derivatives normally and then perform back propagation. But more generally, even in this, you can actually use MLPs 
to to uh, analyze uh, to model sequences by tying them through the divergence, where the divergence itself is defined between sequences. The simplification of saying that the divergence is the sum of the divergences at individual instances will actually give you, uh, will just convert your input sequence to something like a mini batch where you add derivatives over all of the columns. But if you have a more complex divergence, which is defined between sequences, then, then uh, you're going to be critically dependent on being able to compute the derivative of this divergence with respect to each of the outputs, after which the backpropagation follows your standard backpropagates. So, uh, and typically in these kinds of situations, if you're just going to be decomposing the divergence into a sum of uh, instant wise di divergences, then you would be using something like a callback lateral divergence or a cross entropy loss, which are the same thing. So this one here uh, is the more interesting one because now we get into true records. And while we discuss it, we're going to briefly detour into modeling language. In a time synchronous recurrent network, the network produces one output for each input. So again, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the inputs and the outputs. So th this is a genuine recurrent net, which means that the output at any time is related to what is computed at other times. We use such networks, for example, in problems like stock prediction, assigning grammar tags to words in a sequence, uh, particularly for problems like grammar tagging, the network may be bi-directional because you will see the entire input English sentence and you, are, you have the ability to look at the entire sentence before deciding the tag for each word. So this network can be bi-directional, but still there is going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input and the output, regardless of the fact that the network is bi-directional. Now in the explanations that follow, I'm going to assume unidirectional networks, but these ideas are easily extended to bi-directional networks and you will do this in your homework. So here, uh, the, uh, we train the network using variants of gradient descent. We're going to use backpropagation through time to compute the gradients. We start with a collection of, uh, in, of sequence training instance, instances where each instance includes an input sequence and a desired output sequence. And these two are of the same length. They must be of the same length because we are speaking of a time synchronous network. And we're going to do a look at, we're going to stay with time synchronous networks as our basic platform, because it turns out that all of the other models, many of the other models can be explained in terms of time synchronous networks. Now, to compute the derivatives for each training instance, we first perform inference on the input in the forward pass, and you compute the entire sequence of outputs. Then we compute the, compute the derivatives of the divergence between the actual and desired output sequences with respect to the network parameters and intermediate variables and propagate them backwards. This is just BPTT. The key point is the divergence. The divergence whose derivatives we must compute is computed between the sequence of outputs by the network and the desired output sequence. Again, this is not necessarily the sum of the divergences at individual times. This is a divergence between uh, sequences. So a time delay neural network is not a recurrent network, but it is time synchronous. Right. So as a first step, we're going to, whatever the divergence function is, I'm going to leave the divergence function open now. But as a first step, regardless of how you compute the divergence, how you define the divergence sequence, divergence, it is very important that the definition of the divergence must allow you to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of these outputs. 
you need to be able to know how much perturbing any of these guys a little bit will change the divergence. That is the restriction we have on the divergence. Once you have, once you have a divergence to this property, then you can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of these outputs. And then you can propagate the deri those derivatives backwards using just all the usual formulae that we saw for recurrent networks last week. So the key component again is the computation of this derivative over here, which is the derivative of the divergence with respect to the individual outputs. And that depends on the definition of the divergence itself. Now, although the divergence is between two sequences, one common assumption that we make to simplify problems is to assume that the sequence divergence is actually just the sum of the divergences computed locally at individual instance. So this is the vision, vision that we've got, the divergence between sequences. But when we get to, you know, when, when we get to being practical, this is an assumption we'll of, often make that we can compute the divergence between this output and this desired output, the divergence between this output and this desired output, between this output and this desired output and sum them all up. And the sequence divergence is just the sum of these local divergences. Now, once you define the divergence this way, then the derivative of the sequence divergence with respect to say this output is simply going to be the derivative of the local divergence with respect to that output. So the derivative of the sequence divergence with respect to any output is simply going to be the derivative of the local divergence at that time with respect to that output. So, and, and the local divergence in this situation, the local divergence that we will use most frequently is the callback leibler divergence. And if you're using a one hot representation for the target output, this is just your cross entropy loss. So questions, anyone? No? I'm going to spend the last 15 minutes of the class uh, sort of working on a simple example of using uh, time synchronous models, trying to model text. Here, you want to learn a model that can take in, say, a sequence of characters, L, I, N, C, O, L, and it must guess the next character or a model that takes the sequence of words to be or not to, and it must guess the next word. In both cases, the problem boils down to this. It observes a sequence of symbols, which could be characters or words, and it must predict the next symbol on the sequence, which could be a character or a word. So from W0, it must predict W1. Then from W0 and W1, it must predict W2. From W0, W1, and W2, it must predict W3 and so on. So here is an illustration again from Andre Karpathy of such a computation uh, for the word hello. Here the input of is the sequence of characters H, G, L, L. And after reading H, it, it, it must, uh, it, it, it should output ideally the next symbol, which is E. After reading H and E, it should output L. After reading H, E, and L, it must output L, L again. After reading H, E, L, and L, it must output O. But we have to take a few things into consideration first. Words and characters are symbols, while neural networks require the num input to be num numeric numbers, right? So the inputs are going to be represented as one hot vectors, as shown over in the input layer here. Actually, we will represent it as an M, as embedding vectors derived from these one hot vectors. We'll see how in a few minutes. The actual output is not going to be a single symbol. The output is going to be a probability distribution over all of the symbols. Here, this in, in Karpati's example, he's showing the logits, but then you'd apply the softmax on it and you get a probability distribution. And so what you really want is that when it sees the character H, the probability of E must be the highest out here. When after seeing H and E over here, 
the probability of L must be the highest here, and so on. So when it's seen the entire input sequence, you want the most probable character to be the character O. To train the network, the input sequence of symbols goes in. At each time, the target seek output is the next symbol in the sequence. So because you're always, in this case, when you're training a language model, a model that predicts the next sequence in a, a symbol in a sequence, you don't need separate input and output uh, values in a training instance. If I just get a sequence, the sequence both holds the input and the output. So if I get as a training example, uh, H-E-L-L-O, this is actually sufficient, right? Just from the input over here, H-E-L, from the word, I know the target output at each time. So simply having the word, hello, gave me all the information required to, to, to extract the inputs at each time and also the outputs at each time. And so when I'm trying to train the sequence model at each time, the target output is the next symbol in the sequence. After seeing W0, the target output is W1. After seeing W0 and W1, the target output is W2. After seeing W0, W1, and W2, the target output is W3, and so on. Now, again, what the network actually outputs at any time is the probability distribution over the symbols. Given, uh, or if these symbols are words, it's going to give you the probability distribution of, over the words, given all the words until then. So given W0, W1, and W2, here the network is actually going to be outputting a probability distribution over all the words, and you want the probability of W3 to be highest. So the divergence that you're going to define at any time, so, so what the network actually outputs at any time, T, is going to be a probability distribution, the ith component of which is the probability of the ith word in the vocabulary, given the history, right? All the previous words. And you will be computing the callback library divergence between the target word and this, probability distribution. And we've already seen that if I'm going to represent this target word as a, as a one hot vector, then the KL divergence simply becomes minus of the log of the probability assigned to the target word by the network. So the overall divergence is the sum over all time of the negative of the log of the probabilities assigned to the target word at each time by the network. And this is what we're going to try to minimize. Now, I'm going to take a slight detour into a related problem here, language modeling. How to model la, the language with time synchronous nets or more generally how to model language. Consider this general problem. Four score and seven years. What's the next word? Anyone who's familiar with American history is going to say the next, next word next word is ago. Or if I have this character sequence, A, B, R, H, A, M, L, I, N, C, O, L, I ask you what's the next character, you will immediately be able to tell me the next character is M. But now I want a recurrent neural network to do this. So first, we are going to represent the words, the symbols, uh, which would be words, if you're, if you're modeling words, as one hot vectors. For this, we're going to pre-specify a vocabulary of words in a fixed order, say lexical order, like this one. If the vocabulary has n words, now each word is now represented by an n-dimensional one hot vector with n minus one zeros and a one in the position of the word. So uh, if Aardvark is the second word in our lexicon. The one, uh, one hot vector for the word Aardvark is going to have a one in the second position and zero elsewhere. Aaron over here is the third word. So the one hot vector is going to have just a one in the third position. If you were modeling characters, characters can be similarly represented. Uh, you will be typically require about 100 characters to represent 
almost all English text, including lower and uppercase characters, special characters, etc. So a one hot representation of characters is going to be hundred dimensional. A one hot representation of words can have hundreds of thousands of dimensions. The general problem of predicting language, language modeling, is the problem of learning a function f that takes in n one one hot vectors into the net and outputs ideally a one hot vector which predicts the next word. So it takes the first n words and predicts the uh, n plus one word where everything is represented as a one hot vector. Now the problem is if you're dealing with English, say, these vectors are all maybe a hundred thousand dimensions. So these are all very high dimensional vectors. If this were Russian, these vectors would all be about 400,000 dimensions because you need a 400,000 dimensional uh, word vocabulary for Russian. So the number of parameters in this network can become very, very large. Now, this high dimensionality problem happens because we use one hot representations. One hot representations are very wasteful. An n dimensional one hot vector, a representation of words, lives in an n dimensional space. So, for example, with a 100k vocabulary, our words will be in a 100k dimensional space. So, guys, I'm going to go five minutes over, so please stay with me, right? So, in this gigantic n dimensional space, you're going to have only n relevant vectors. And they're going to live on the axis, so on, on these corners of, of the uh, unit hypercube, the corners that actually lie on the axis. So if you have 100,000 word vocabulary, your representation is 100,000 dimensions. But in those 100,000 dimensions, you only have 100,000 vectors, one for each word. And that is clearly a very uh, inefficient use of the space. And there's something worse, right? So consider this example here. Here you have a three word vocabulary, but the only three points in the space that you actually use are 100, 0, 0, 010, 0, and 0, 0, 001. Now if somebody were to give you another point very close to this one, say out here, which is one epsilon or out here, right? which is one epsilon delta, where epsilon and delta are very small, except for epsilon and delta equal to zero. But any position which is not exactly at that corner, this point really has no meaning. It doesn't represent any word. So the actual volume of this entire space that represents meaningful, meaningful values is zero, just these three points. Although you have this entire space, the volume of the space that represents anything meaningful is zero. And if you view this in terms of density of points, if we consider the edge of the cube to be say of length, length r, there are going to be only n points in r raised to n volume. So the density of the points is also vanishingly small. So given the wastefulness of the representation, why do we use it? Why can't we just use some other lower dimensional representation? It's because a priori, you know, why do I need to use a three dimensional representation with three words? Why could I not just say, I'm going to randomly come up with two words and say, my first word is two one, the second word is three seven, the fourth, third word is six one, six four, right? I could just come up with two dimensional vectors to represent my words. So I think Why in that we do it? Yeah, so in ahead. that case, you will need to train it, right? If you are going for a continuous. Why, why can I not? Why can I not choose it arbitrarily? Um, so how will you choose it arbitrarily? Because you have a lot of vocabulary and I mean that. Yeah, but then I could right? Like if I could have just said I could have just said one one zero one and one zero, right? This is binary and this is perfectly rational. Two bits. Why don't I use that? 
because maybe that does not like create a bias for some words so um, what really happens is that in the beginning you cannot assume make any assumption about the relative similarity of words right if i use anything of this kind then the distance between these two words is greater than the distance between these two words right you are arbitrarily imposing a, a distance notion between words which may have nothing to do with reality so when you have a one hot representation the specialty of the one hot representation is that the distance between any two words is exactly the same what's the distance what's the euclidean distance between any two words here anyone what's the of square root of 2 right so you are keeping all of the words equidistant you are not imposing any prior biases on the on the relative uh similarity or the relationship of words any time you choose something else of this kind you are biasing the network you're saying this word whatever it is is closer to this guy that i mean the, the, the similarity of these two words is greater than the similarity of these two words and that not be that may not be reasonable at all so you want the network to not be biased by you but then this is wasteful of space so what we will do is to do exactly what tushar mentioned we will sort of learn a lower dimensional representation which is hopefully meaningful and we will project the vectors into a lower dimensional subspace but we're going to learn this projection so more generally we will learn a dimensionality reducing transform p to map our one hot vectors w into a lower dimensional vector p w and then projecting them into the lower dimensionality subspace also greatly increases the density of points by many orders of magnitude and this increases the efficiency of the use of the space so if you project from a 100k dimensional space to say Uh, to to uh, uh, say a thousand dimensional space, then we get hundred orders of magnitude improvement in the density of the problems. Also, when we project the data onto a lower dimensional space, like we're projecting this three dimensional vectors into two dimensions over here on this two D plane, we will change the distances between vectors. And if we learn, if we learn this plane. then these distances will immediately begin giving us some notion of the distances between the words themselves and these distances could be meaningful and capture some semantics so here's what we will do instead of working directly with the original one hot vectors w we're going to first project and project them all down by multiplying them with a the dimensionality we are using transform to pw and the function f works on pw to make the to predict the next word observe that the predicted word is still the complete word it's only working it's on it says that the input to the function is that is the dimensionality reduced representation to the word now a projection multiplying by matrix is basically just a linear layer right so this projection p is like applying the same linear layer to every one of these words and if this is also a differentiable neural network then the output of this linear layer goes into this network it makes a prediction you can compare it to the uh, target output and you can pass the derivatives backwards to train these projections and p will now be one of the parameters of the net that is learned if you learn it properly using an appropriate objective then we can expect the spatial relations of these projections to be semantically meaningful now the figure that i showed over here is uh is actually so i have a question the network yeah Uh, if we are projecting the one hot encoded um forms to a more dense representation and the one hot encoded forms are by themselves um they they sort of have some independence they don't have any strict meaning about distance between two points how do we project something that's not necessarily meaningful to something that is meaningful 
So you don't, right? You, you don't decide the meaning, you learn it. This P is learned, okay? So here is the simple model that we're gonna use. Every word is predicted. So let's say uh, I decide to predict W5 using W1, W2, W3. I decide to predict every word using the past four words. Then this is the model you'd be using. W1 through W4 are each projected down and then you use it to predict W5. W2 through W5 are each projected down, you use it to predict W6 and so on. And then you can compute the divergences over here, perform backdrop and learn all the parameters of this network, including P. And now P is found. What is the structure? Anyone recognize the structure? This one? That's just a TDNN, right? That's just a time delay neural network. So uh, we're going to be here, you would predict every one of the words, uh, but before, before being employed for prediction, each word is going to be projected down. Now, the TDNN model over here is actually a proper language model, which also learns to predict the uh, next unseen word in a sequence. But if our objective is not to learn to model, model the language, but to learn these projections, then other kinds of models are possible, like the soft bag of words, which predicts a, a word based on keywords on either side without actually considering their order. Or uh, the skip gram, which uses a word to predict all the words in the past and the future. And uh, you can learn the parameters of these networks using, using backdrop. And it turns out that the low dimensional representations you learn end up capturing a lot of language structure. So here's this famous picture from Nikolov's 2013 paper, which got much of the recent work in uh, uh, the area of language embeddings rolling. These are 2D PCA visualizations of the learned word embeddings. And see the word, see, so these are all the, the, the locations of various words on the projected plane. And see how, see the vector that connects China to Beijing, right? and then see the vector that connects Poland to Warsaw, see the vector that connects Spain to Mali. So what we see is that the vectors, the positional relationship between a country and its capital seems to be the same or very similar for all of the countries, right? Uh, he also showed how you can similarly get things like, uh, uh, so here you get China minus Beijing, equals Poland minus Warsaw, equals Russia minus Moscow, approximately. So the, the uh, uh, positional relationships become semantically meaningful. Then he had other examples where he showed uh, man minus woman was the same as king minus queen and so on. It seems to learn the right thing. You'll, you'll be doing more of this in your homeworks. This is just a uh, quick, uh, quick uh, introduction to the concept because we will use it. And we're going to use something else. So uh, going back to modeling language, now I can train a recurrent network to predict the next word using the time synchronous model. Only we wouldn't be directly using the one hot representations. We'd be using embeddings obtained by projecting down. down. Now, simple RNNs are not going to be great for this task. So typically this layer over here is going to be LSTMs often many layers of LSTMs. And we'll train this model from lots of text. Now, again, we don't need labels with the text. The label at any time is simply going to be the next word. So all we need is large corpora of text and it will learn the parameters of the model. And now we can use this learned model to synthesize text. Once we train the model, we can provide it with the first few words, say, uh, the first three words as one hot vectors, which will get projected down. And then when the last word goes in, the network is going to output a probability distribution for the next word. I can randomly sample a word from this probability distribution and input that as the next word in the sequence to the recurrent network. And now using these sequence of words, it's going to output a probability distribution here from which I can draw the next word and feed that back in. And I can continue to do this uh, until it has 
uh, until it has produced large amounts of text and you can come up with your own criterion for termination. Termination can have, can be arbitrary or you can have a natural termination. For example, an end of sentence marker or if you're synthesizing programs like in the example we saw last week when the last place is closed. And so when we saw this example of neural network synthesized code, that's exactly what was done. A character level model was trained on the entire Linux source code. And the first few characters were input into the trained model and the rest of the program was synthesized. Uh, this is an actually a, a, a much nicer example. I don't know if I will have, uh, let me just try to play this once before yeah, we're done with the lecture. But just let me see if I can uh, share the computer. Okay, can you guys hear this now? Oh no, there's a PPT. So this one, uh, I'll post this on Piazza. Here, the author trained a network on several piano pieces in MIDI format and used it to generate more music. And it sounds entirely plausible. And this is just a recommend network, simple LSTM network, synthesizing music. And so we sort of presented some basic concepts and uh, we've looked at uh, time synchronous networks. We briefly mentioned the problem of divergence, but then we digressed into language modeling. So we're going to return from our digression in the next class to the problem of network variance and, and variance and divergences. And uh, uh, we'll see the specific example of time order synchronous, but time asynchronous divergences over the next class and see how we will deal with it. So I'll stop right here. Uh, I'll stop the recording. And if you have any questions, you may ask.